Hello, it's Jamie at Bowyer Bushcraft, and today I am talking to you about axes. Um, more importantly, what I do with an axe when I, when I buy a brand new one. I don't actually take it straight out into the field. There's just a couple of things I like to do to bring it up to, should we say, my standard. Well, first I'm going to talk about, briefly, the small forest axe. This is made by Grandsworf Brooks of Sweden. And this is a very popular axe in the world of bushcraft. We see many people with them. There are a few other companies these days that make similar style axes. This small uh, middle sized version, should we say, a general purpose bushcraft axe. But this has been probably the most dominant one of the market. And for good reason, these are very well made axes. And um, I'm very fond of them. I don't think I'll ever go with any other brand simply because I'm just in love with it. And, and my muscle memory, I'm completely used to its size and all that kind of thing. Well, I actually bought this when I was 15 years old. I cut hedges for the money. And back then, they were only 50 pounds. Now they're about 120 pounds now um, to purchase. And even now, they're still worth the money in my opinion. So, why have I felt the need to buy another axe? Well, first things first, there's nothing wrong with having a spare axe. I used to have two of these, but I sold one to a friend. And I'll probably buy another one again. Um, like I say, this is a general purpose axe, a small forest axe. I'll probably do a, a much more in-depth video on, on that at some point. But I've done all sorts of this. So I went to college to study bushcraft. It went, went with me all the way through college. I've made spoons with it, I've made bows with it. I've cut trees down with it, I've split wood with it for fire and all that kind of thing, all the general purpose bushcraft survival stuff. Now, there's nothing wrong with her. These have a 20 year guarantee on them, so it's still got a bit of life left in it, and even then it'll be fine. But I wanted to give her a break because she does a lot of work and I make a lot of bows and I just like to spread the load. So, I have here a brand new carpenter's axe. This is still by Grandsworth Brooks of Sweden. And it's a little bit different. Now let's just get this off of it. They always come with this little pamphlet and a little book. It's great. It actually even says 20 year guarantee there. I actually thought that, that was just on the, the, the axe handle, the shaft, but um, I think it must be for the whole thing. So, why have I bought the carpenter's axe? Well, like I said, I'm a bow maker. I make bows, I'm a bow year. And um, yeah, I wanted one. It's a really good size. It's very similar to the small forest axe. So it feels like I'm using a very similar tool. Um, it has, if you look at the edge here, it's flat. It's not curved like the other one. And that's really good for carpentry. And also the actual bevel, which is the cutting edge, uh, is actually a flat ground edge. Okay, so that means that it's, it's like this, whereas the small forest axe is actually convex, so it's a bit more rounded, should we say. Uh, and that's so that when you're chopping wood, chopping a tree down, it doesn't get stuck in there like a wedge. Um, but we don't have to worry about that with this, because we're going to be cutting wood and you know shaping things up and that kind of stuff. So, what I wanted to say is when I get one of these axes, new, there's nothing wrong with it, you could take it out. But a couple of things I do is I actually resharpen it because it's the, the, the bevel is it is sharp when it comes, but I, I like to do it myself and really polish it up. But it's the handle. Um, this to me needs a little bit of work on it. It's not ideal. It's not perfect, and I want it to be right. If we look at this other axe here, although it looks old, it's very smooth. In fact, I pulled it out my rucksack the other day, and someone went, "My gosh, that's a well a well oiled handle, Jamie." Every time I sharpen this axe, it gets a bit more oil in it, a bit of linseed oil, and sometimes even beeswax. And that's how it's managed to stay healthy all these years and, and in good shape. You know, this wood's going to last a long time. And if we have a smooth, well sanded axe handle, uh, it's actually a lot grippier as well. Uh, if that makes sense. So I'm going to simply show you today how I sand this and oil it. Uh, and bring it up to a standard that I'm happy to use. So, uh, we're going to need some sandpaper, we're going to need some boiling hot water, linseed oil, and maybe some wax. Now, what we're going to be going for is something they call gunstock finish. Okay, And what we're going to do is actually pour boiling hot water over the, the handle, the shaft, 
and all the grain is going to come out, it's going to rise up and we're going to do that a couple of times, sand it off and then go down sandpaper. So we're going to go from a heavy, a coarse one to a finer sandpaper and eventually we're going to do something called boning. So I'm going to wait for that to boil. Once it's boiled, I'm going to pour it over the axe handle. Okay, I've got some sandpaper here. Um, always buy a good quality sandpaper. There are sandpapers that aren't, aren't as good as others. And just before I pour that water on, I'm actually going to just rough, rough up the wood here a little bit, just to help it, because they may have put some oil on it and that kind of stuff. And uh, I just want to get rid of that. So don't be afraid. And there are little blemishes and things that I don't want to see in there. Sort of machine marks and that kind of thing. Here she is, and the grain, like I said, it's starting to rise, and I'll be able to do a bit of a close-up shot once it's dried. I actually sometimes say to people, a bit mud on it. I actually sometimes say to people, maybe do this before you go to bed, so that when you wake up in the morning, it's ready to sand. I thought while we're waiting for it to dry, it would be a good idea to go over some axe terminology, talk about the different areas and what they're called. So. What we have here, starting at the top, this whole area is the head. This is called a pole. This little area here is the shoulder. This little bit here that comes up is known as the lip. This side is called the cheek. This section here where we see the, the handle come through the head, that's called the eye. And these older ones the older models actually have a wedge in there. There's also a wooden wedge. They've, they've actually got rid of the metal wedge now, which kind of disappoints me because I like to see it on there. This area here is called the bit, kind of like a drill bit. This here is called the heel, this bottom corner, going up to the toe at the top. The whole side there is what we call a bevel. And then along the side, the very edge, is called the edge. Coming down we have the grip which is next to the throat. We have the back and we have the belly. So that's kind of like um, bow terminology because we have a back and a belly in that. And this is called an end knob. Now I hope I haven't embarrassed myself by forgetting anything there. I've always referred to these as sheath. Uh, but I think actually the correct terminology is it's called a mask. Either way, I'm sure we all uh, know what I'm talking about. And actually, unfortunately, the mask that it comes with doesn't last that long. My carpenter's axe will probably be okay because it's going to be more of a workshop thing. But when you're in the woods using it constantly, often the rivets used to come out. Um, this is me talking about 15 years ago, so they may have put better rivets in now. But... Uh, I imagine it would be better so to buy a new one, you can get new ones, so you can get someone to make one for about 20 or 30 pounds. Uh, I suppose it would be worth mentioning that the head is made out of a high carbon steel. Sweden is renowned for very good high carbon steel. I say to people, look, you know, when you're buying your tools, Sweden, Sweden, Sweden. So a lot of people are familiar with the Mora knives. This is a... Um, kind of like a training knife but the better version of the training knife every bushcrafter really has started out something like this probably made by Mora and they've finally made a slightly better version where I think this is a 3.2 millimeter blade anyway where I'm going with this is this is well made and it's uh, carbon steel from Sweden it's good stuff saws all that kind of thing and you might say Jamie carbon steel isn't that going to rust and I would say if you don't look after it yeah it will rust and you would be uh, you'd be in my bad books if you're on my course and it got rusty I'd be very upset with you like I say this has been out with me in all conditions for you know over the over the last sort of 15 years 
and really uh, you know there's no rust on there whatsoever um, I do slightly oil the head every now and again and like I say that the, the axe handle people might say oh shouldn't we be getting something like some sort of poly some sort of plastic that kind of thing no no just look after it if, if you're going to be using this tool you're going to have to be keeping it sharp razor sharp if you want to get the best performance for it you actually finish it with a, a leather razor uh, strop you remember you see the barbers doing their their um their cutthroat on the on the razor strop there so we have to look after these tools for it to stay alive over a long period of time i mean if you neglect it it'll still live a long time but if we look after these tools, they will look after us, and I can guarantee that if you look after it, it will do a fantastic job of serving you in the woods. You know, I, I always say, you know, I call it female, I go, oh, she's doing well, because I don't really feel like oiling up a male, if I'm honest with you. Um, so, yeah, she's a good girl, she's looked after me, I look after her, and we're very, very happy in our relationship. Okay, if we just look, we can see the grain coming up ever so slightly there. Uh, and now we're going to sand that off. And I might repeat that process a couple of times. Okay, there we go. So that's all risen like that because of the, the boiling hot water we put over it. Okay. So I'm going to leave this to dry just a little bit longer. I'm going to sand that off, repeat, and then go through the sandpapers. Okay, I'm happy that this is dried enough and that the grain has risen enough for me to continue. Sometimes if it's still a bit damp, the sandpaper doesn't work very well. You've got to remember sandpaper, it needs to be dry. So, uh, continuing with the 80 grip, which was the much coarser one, I'm just going to take that risen grain off. This can be, uh, you can use this for anything by the way, you know, I finish bows like this, people finish gun stocks like this, anything really, I helped a, a friend with her uh, table, she had a wooden table, we did it this way, it's a good technique. Now, I'm going to pour water over it one more time. I won't bother showing you that. You just do it. You could do it a few times just until it stops rising. And the hotter the water, the more boiled it is, the better. You know, if you let it cool down, it could be a bit problematic. So sometimes I've even done it in the shower, but hotter water is the best. When I say a shower, that's when I've been doing a long bow. That's why I use the shower. But anyway, let's pour some more water over this and continue the process. Okay. So I've poured water over it again, and not much grain came up, but a little bit did. So I'm actually happy to move on from that process now. So I'll just give it a really quick little, with the 80 grip, and I'm now gonna start going through the sandpapers. There's no real magic to that. So I'll just talk about, um, a little bit about that, and then where I'm gonna go after that, which is a bit more important. All right, I'm gonna go on to the, the 100 grip now. A uh, little trick that my stepdad taught me, which I think is good, is uh, this has sort of just come off, you know, it's come out of the factory and it kind of helps if you put it on a hard edge and just do this. It helps break it up. So sometimes, um, especially on lower quality sandpapers, it can kind of, bits of sandpaper can crumble off. You just do this, it kind of helps it get ready, really. Now, how do I judge going from one sandpaper to another? When is it ready? It's kind of a bit instinctive, really. You just need to have a look. You'll see scratch marks from, from the 80 grit. Sand that away, and there'll be new sort of scratch marks at a finer level. And then you go, yeah, I'm happy with that, and you move on. And that's all I'm going to do now. So really no magic. But everywhere I've sanded, I'm going to go over it again. And it'll feel smoother as well. This isn't the most lengthy process, so don't worry about it, it's not going to take you forever. And you've only got to do it once. Okay, done with the 100, now I'm moving on to the 120. Um, 
So it is starting to feel a lot smoother. I'm actually kind of excited because I really like how this comes out at the end. So I'm not going to bore you with me standing through all this. I'm just going to keep cutting to the next one. Okay, 120, done. Did forget to mention that uh, earlier you saw me doing a little bit of spot reduction. Uh, and as I mentioned, that's because there were some tool marks left there from, from the tools I used to shape this. After that though, it is full length because, I mean, this is hard wood and you don't really need to worry too much because you won't be able to remove too much material from one area very fast. Um, but we're doing a full length, you know, so that it is even. Although, like I say, it's not too much of a worry, but it's worth mentioning. Now, I'm about to get into the much finer stuff. So we've gone to the 120, you're going to do a bit of a jump now, because we're going to go to 180, then we're going to go to 320, and then 400. And then, after that, there's another little trick that I like to use. So, let's crack on with 180. is going to start looking really nice now. Um, regarding the uh, sort of spot reduction stuff, you might want to give a little extra attention just around the lip here because it's kind of hard to get really close up to it. But it's doable. Mine doesn't quite get right into the edge. I'm not too worried. It's the same on the other one. Um, again, we're doing this so that it protects the wood better, makes it, in my opinion, grippier because when it's like shiny like that, on my skin anyway, it's very, very grippy. So, that's where it starts to come to life. Here we are, completely sanded, very smooth, and kind of feeling very ungrippy at the moment because it's really like it's got talcum powder over it, you know, from all the sanding. Well, what we're going to do is this is a piece of broken arrow. It's an old arrow, a piece of dowel, anything like that will work. Which is we're going to do something called boning. I'm going to rub this all over there, like that. And it's going to compress any fibres from the sandpapers left. You can use wire wool and things like that. But even after that, I would still do this. Very simple, no magic here, is we're just going to go all over it like that. I actually find that softer woods, this being pine, um, kind of work better for this. Someone else might say, no, no, it needs to be harder, but I kind of feel like it, it grips it a bit more. It starts to bite. Um, yeah. And wow, I can already see a shine coming. I think what I'll do is compare sides. So. And I, again, I do this on all sorts of stuff. This isn't just for axe, this is for anything. And again, the style that we're looking for is called London Gunstock Finish. Some might say I've not fully followed those principles of, of true uh, London Gunstock Finish, but that's the sort of direction we're going in, that, that kind of finish. Yeah, this is looking very, very smooth noticeably different. I don't know if the camera will pick up on it, but I'll, I'll try and show you. Okay, so if you just look, that's the side that I've boned. If you can see the sh bit, of a, bit of a shine to it, flip it over, that's the side I haven't. It does not have that same shine to it. So if you want to go the extra mile, take a piece of dowel and just bone it like that compress those fibers well this is looking very good this is now up to my standard that i'm happy with much smoother much more of a professional finish excellent wood excellent product i'm happy so we're on to the next stage very simple this is actually linseed oil it looks a bit funny because it's got shaken up as i brought it to the site usually it's much clearer all I'm going to do is put a coating of linseed oil on it. Now, there's boiled linseed oil, normal linseed oil. Um, you can you can try either or. You could do both. Some people put the thinner stuff on first, and then the boiled linseed oil is a bit thicker, that kind of thing. And um, I'm not worried though. This is just normal, standard linseed oil. I'm going to put it on, and that really brings it to life. Don't be afraid to get oil on it. You know, I actually, uh, I let it get really oil 
oily. Don't forget to get some on the eye there. Don't worry about getting it on the steel. The linseed oil doesn't actually affect that. If anything, it'll benefit it. Get it underneath there. Kind of hard to get it in that hole. This is a rag I actually use regularly, so it's quite oily. Even like just to get my hands on it like this, really working in, get some heat in there. See why it's a female. This won't be the last time this gets oiled. Like I say, this is something I do quite religiously, and um, it's gonna it's gonna keep it in really good shape for many many years. Lovely, absolutely lovely. Works my excess in. Now, this stuff is finishing wax. I actually usually get the beeswax version. I accidentally picked this one up. It's just a clear one. It says it's made from four different types of wax. Have to open it. Go. So it's soft stuff. We we'll put it on. I'm going to use the same rag. And um, it's great, it's just it's just that finishing touch. It kind of dries, and then you can give it another little polish. And this is really, really gonna protect it and just give it the finish that I believe it deserves. Because these are fantastically well-made tools. I actually know that some people even wax the, the heads and I've even heard some people using this stuff on actually gun barrels, the old, the old um, guns that are blued with the old, the old fashioned bluing that's maybe a bit different from the modern stuff. I've never really done that, but it's something I hear gets done, so you can investigate that yourself. And there we have it, ready for use in the field. Of course, this is more of a more of a workshop tool this one although it doesn't mean i won't be taking it out to bushcraft events and teaching and it will it will go outside this one so at the moment of course you know it's got excess oil and beeswax on it normal wax sorry wow look at that i'll do another close-up because that is just a wonderful finish There you have it, the job's done. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope the this new skill is something you can use and you can use it in other areas, but I do advise if you're gonna get this ax, give it a go. It works very well, it makes it work better, grip better, longer life. And this isn't the last time this will be getting oiled, like I said. Now there is actually a bit of a story behind this ax. It's a bit of a sad story, but it's a bit of a nice story as well. My stepfather came up to me the other day and he said, Jamie, um, do you remember saying to me that you want to retire your axe? And I said, oh yeah, at some point. He said, well, would you like your brother to buy you the new axe? I said, well, yes, I would like that actually. My brother died a year ago and there was some money left over of his, my stepdad had. And my stepdad knew me very well knew that I would cherish this axe for the rest of my life just as I have the other one and that it would be nearly the perfect gift for me because of who I am and how I feel about these crafts that I do and I'm very grateful that he decided to do that for me because this will always remind me of my brother my brother's always with me and I love him you know in my heart but it's nice to have such a special gift bought out of the last little bit of his money that I can have to cherish and love. So I just take this opportunity to say that I love my brother a great deal and I miss him. And I'm very grateful for all the times I had with him, all the wonderful walks in the woods we had. So I hope you've enjoyed this and I look forward to seeing you again.